Talk and Shop Podcast, Episode 99, Aaron Judge, Eric Gagne, and everybody else who wore the number 99, Dennis they're tuning in. Rodman. They're watching. Rodman's here. Flicky's here. Um, I'm fired up. I can't believe it. 99 episodes deep. Uh, next week will be a hundo. Proud. Proud of this podcast. What is this thing? How did it get started? Me and some guy named Chad Chop, who uh, was a coach for the Giants and the Dodgers, uh, won a couple of World Series rings, then decided, hey, let, uh, let's create a podcast on making youth sports better. Let's educate parents and coaches. Enough of this yelling at umpires, uh, demeaning kids. Uh, we got to teach love of play. We got to, we got to, give coaches some priorities to work with. Um, and boy, oh boy, uh, have you listeners jumped in uh, and, and and helped create this community. I am James Lowe, a.k.a. Coach Ballgame. Coach Flick Money is in the house with me. Uh, Chad Chop will be a few minutes late, so he'll jump in uh, uh, when he arrives. He's been coaching some kids. But Flick Money, it's good to see you, brother. Uh, how are you? Where do we find you today? Coach, uh, it's great to be here. Um, an honor to be a part of this podcast and this community. You find me today. I am in the um, lobby, uh, lobby slash um, beverage depot of a uh, of the Tulalip Resort um, Hotel. And so I uh, thought I'd all right, class up the joint a little bit, representing the Seattle Kraken hockey today, representing my Scottish and Irish heritage with the lid, representing Vikings across the world with the beard, and uh, representing love of play, love of humanity, and uh, love of the game of baseball for coaches, man. Let's get after this. I love it, man. I love it. Well, if you don't know Flick Money, uh, he taught me most everything I know, my personal coach ball game. Um, and, and me, him and Chad Chop were, we're together next week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday for another launch of the coach ball game playbook, uh, a deep dive, uh, 20 years for me, even more for Chad Chop and flick money, our minds, uh, in a curriculum, three days of zooms. If you've already partaken, uh, by all means, tell your friends to jump back in, uh, it's intimate. It's live. If you can't make the lives, you can do the recordings. Uh, but the links are all up in my bios. It's on my website as well. Uh, but this is a starter kit for all coaches uh, on how to wrangle, how to inspire, how to communicate, uh, how to run effective practices, how to plan those practices, how to teach skills in a fun way. Um, so it's not just baseball. It's all the sports. And uh, the testimonials that have come in from the previous launches um, fire me up. Uh, my passion bucket gets full. So the community is lit. Old oh, snap. Uh, you should join in. So uh, come on down uh, the mornings of Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday next week, uh, and we'll do this uh, through the cyberwebs. Um, I, I, I want to talk with Chad Chopper uh, about the World Series matchup. He has been in that clubhouse with the Dodgers. Uh, I want to get the secrets to the sauce. Why are they back? Uh, I want to talk to both of you about uh, what, what it's going to come down to between these Yankees and Dodgers, uh, specifically the randomness of playoffs and World Series matchups. What kind of randomness uh, is going to happen? And what are the secrets to that randomness? Sure, there's random. But I feel like there's some, uh, whether it be tips from coaches, uh, culture in the clubhouse, uh, nuggets from the from from the clubby, whatever it might be, there are things that can happen to give you an edge. So uh, we'll save that for the end of our pod when Chop is here. But we've got a laundry list of questions that have been coming in. Thank you for your questions, listeners. Patreons, thank you for supporting. Uh, that's helping Tommy Gold edit some uh, video uh, for the social medias. Follow us, Talk and Shop. Uh, subscribe on my YouTube uh, as all of our video 
podcasts, uh, lay right there. Coach Ball Games YouTube. But let's start with this one, Flick Money. Hey, Coach, love the podcast. Bang, love you back. How would you approach a child that is feeling overwhelmed with too many practices because of multiple sports? Well, I'll start here. Multiple sports are good. I always felt fresh when I was playing two sports at a time. Maybe I had basketball practice on Monday, uh, and then maybe there was baseball practice on a Thursday, and maybe there was a game, uh, whether that be on a Saturday or a Sunday, where I was able to uh, partake in both. And maybe one was a legit league, maybe one was intramural or just uh, more volunteer. Uh, but I think multiple sports at a time can be really good. It keeps you fresh. Um, but Flick Money, what do you say when when it feels like it's getting overwhelming uh, getting into these two sports? Yeah, I'm a big fan of the multi-sport. Also was a multi-sport guy. Um, and it is the case, especially in the summers, um, I got definitely run down running from, you know, a football camp and weights in the morning to a baseball tournament in the afternoon and then summer league basketball in the evening times. Um, I would say uh, that my advice to the player would be um, sit down with your family, have an honest conversation. Here's what I really think I can do well. And here's what I would like, how I would like to craft my schedule. And uh, let's come up with a plan uh, with your family. And then I'm really about empowering. I know you are too, coach, empowering young people to have those conversations with their coaches, uh, learn how to be direct, learn how to look them in the eye, ask for some time. Hey coach, I really appreciate you. Uh, I thank you for coaching. Uh, you know, my life is very full because I play these multiple sports. I think it's important for my development and, um, I need to do some prioritizing right now for my own well being, mentally and emotionally. And, um, Here's how that's going to play out in my schedule. And I just want to run it by you and work with you on it. That's, that would be where I go. I love that. Yeah. And there's that theme again of kind of creating a two-way street where uh, you're just not telling your kid what to do. You're open to having a conversation where you're, you're giving them tools to um, talk about the uncomfortable or bring things up that, that maybe they would brush under the rug. I love that two-way street. That conversation is great. Uh, you're teaching them lots of life lessons for when they uh, jump into the work field uh, or whatever it, whatever they do with their lives. Uh, they're going to need that. So love that. I, I don't think you have to uh, make a firm decision at too young of an age, uh, you know, on what sport it should be. I don't think you have to create this ultimatum of, well, which one do you like more? Uh, maybe you should do that one and quit the other one. I don't think uh, that that's necessary at too young of an age. Um, I, I think uh, if if there's a way to talk to the coach and say, hey, coach, uh, my man, my man is a little overwhelmed with practice, um, uh, loves to play soccer and baseball at the same time. Is there a way maybe he could miss Wednesday batting cages uh, so we could hang out as a family and then we still have these two sports going at once. Uh, the bigger theme is coaches out there. Uh, you've got to be open to kids playing multiple sports. We talk about it all the time. Why? Because when you get to high school or college, those high school and college coaches, they're looking for well-rounded athletes, uh, well-rounded people. So um, don't make it about you. All right. Uh, I think that's another two-way street and conversation you can create is coach and player saying, hey, is this a bit too much? I want to free you up. I want to make sure you can you can enjoy your soccer team, your basketball team, and this team right here. Um, uh, I I it was a life changing moment when a kid came up to me and and said, "My baseball coach won't let me play soccer. I got to play year round baseball." Um, that made me sick to my stomach. So, um, Bang Biscuit, if you're looking on the YouTube, you see Chaparuski with his trim beard. He has uh, arrived. At a boy chopper, um, we we jumped into the questions from from the from the group, and this first one was just about uh, kids that may feel overwhelmed playing too many sports at one time, too many practices, too many games. So I think we hit it pretty hard and pretty strong. So uh, we'll move on to the next one. But flick money, anything to button up that that first question there? No, you nailed it. And I would just like to welcome Coach Chop into the Hartfield. 
Uh, yeah. Beard Thanks, salute. boys. Let's yeah, go. you trim that beard. Go to the YouTube, friends, and 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 look at this trimmed beard. Was there a reason for the trimmy trim? Well, you know, Bo noticed it first thing. Like he woke up, was like, "What'd you? What did you do? What, what do we got? What are we up to with that?" So I do it periodically. You know, just like you got to trim the uh, the bushes outside and the you know the bougainvilleas. It gets thorny and uh, becomes a safety hazard. So you just got to yeah. reset it. Just a reset. It'll, I'll look the same next week. It'll be fully grown out again. Don't worry. Man, I, I I would imagine that our listeners, the 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 group that listens on a weekly basis, maybe the best beards in all of podcast listening. I just yeah, feel you that. Said it. You said yeah. it. I maybe agree. mullets too. Um, uh, uh, Chopper, we teased at the top uh, about a conversation on the World Series. We're going to get into it uh, before we leave today about Dodgers, Yankees. What's it going to take? Who's going to win? Um, but what we wanted to hit some some questions first because we've got such a long list here. Uh, question number two, it, it has to do with fear. And that's a common theme, fear of getting hit. This child's uh, afraid of getting in front of a ground ball. So we're looking for practical things we can do to, to help this kid uh, with ground balls. Uh, he knows how to play those ground balls, but he's choosing to move to the side instead of getting in front. The frustrating part for me as dad is that he knows how to play a ground ball, but I don't think he trusts himself to field it correctly. So there's this uh, fight, internal fight, where he doesn't trust himself. He got hit, uh, and and uh, the, there's, there's some trust that needs to be gained back. So uh, Flick Money, let's start with you here. How do we get that trust uh, within this kid back? Yeah, uh, I remember this one being tough, playing on fields that were not great and feeling like I was going to take one in the chops. Um, not the coach chops, the facial chops. And um, uh, I think we, we touched on it last time. I think a great tool for young people is is playing in practice using the helmet with the, the mask, like either the football style mask or they have the clear plastic shields so that you can work technique and gain some trust in your hands and your ability to protect yourself uh, as you uh, as you advance with the skill. Um, and then uh, the other thing, you know, coach, you're always great vulnerability salute. You know, what's the vulnerability salute looks like? We, we do kinda, a hug. I think we're, yeah, we're kind of here with it. Just coming in yeah, tight. Vulnerability salute. Vulnerable. Yeah. Just telling them, you know, letting them know like, hey, I was in the same spot, man. I really, really used to be afraid of balls coming up on bad fields and catching me in the lips and Took me a while to work through it too. So we're I'm here for you and we're gonna work through it together. I've seen Chopper uh really work hard raking dirt, dragging dirt, dragging fields. I think that's a first step for you as a coach or a dad. Hey kid, uh I've had bad hops hit me in the face too. I feel you. I know how it feels. Uh I'm not gonna shame you, son, but I am gonna rake this dirt. I'm gonna make it as smooth as I can to help you. Um, and then maybe you start doing some drills where it's either a soft baseball or a different type of ball where you're just tossing it. And maybe they're working on short hops uh, where you're awarding small wins. When I see kids that are jumpy or moving their head, I'll get close and I'll toss them a, a ball, maybe a softer baseball, even a tennis ball barehanded. And, and I'll say, OK, this one's a short hop. If you can keep your head still and quiet and field this ball and see it in, boom, that's a win. That's a point for you. So awarding those small wins is also big. Uh, no doubt about it, the protection, uh, throwing a mask, a, a protector on, uh, and then building that culture with the rest of the team. Like, hey, nobody's going to give this kid a hard time for wearing a mask. He got popped in the chops. He's trying to get over this fear. Anybody else want to get popped in the chops? Uh, no way. Let's build a culture of, uh, of having each other's back and having empathy. Uh, Chaparu, anything to add to, to this kid wanting to, wanting to get out of the way of the ground ball? Yeah, I'd say from a coach's standpoint, uh, we touched on a little bit, rake the field and water the field. Um, make sure that you can mitigate the hops as best you can to promote that confidence from the kid of like, all right, dude, I, I saw him rake it. There'll, there'll be times of practice with us where I start seeing some weird hops and I'll just stop and we'll, we'll rake it. We'll, we'll drag it really quick. But hey, let's drag that. He's, he's, I don't want him to get hurt tonight. Um, and then also you can change the pace of the fungo as a coach. 
Um, and then rolling the ball, like you said, a tennis ball, an incredible ball, a wiffle ball, all that stuff plays. I love equipping the kids with how to navigate a hop. So there are no such thing as bad hops. We dictate the hop. We hunt the hop. You're hunting a short hop and a long hop and give them those tools with a tennis ball, rolling it to them, how to shorten the hop, working through the baseball with your hand, leading with your palm, how to give that longer hop space so that it reaches its highest point and then gravity takes over and it becomes predictable. So we've got to equip these kids so that they know, first of all, they're in charge. The ball's not hunting them. They're hunting the baseball um, and then teach them how to, how to hunt that hop. So, um, but I would start with raking and watering the field. That is, I tell you what, right now, boys, our parents did that for us. And I see so many fields that are so bad now. And it's like, we've got to, got to pay that forward, man. Better yeah, I mean, they're, 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 that's, that's a quick way to uh, create, create distrust in, in a kid's brain is they're doing all the right things. And then this thing hits this bad hop and goes this way. Um, and, and all the mechanics are out the window. So uh, I will say this, you'll never be able to force the fear out of them. So don't, don't force it. Don't yell it out of them. Uh, lead by example and tread with empathy. Uh, think of the most afraid you've ever been. Uh, for me, that was when my first daughter was about to be born. And that's about what that kid's thinking when a ground ball comes their way. Uh, bang biscuit. Can I share hey, how coach. I got it wrong with my oldest? Oh, a little vulnerability salute. Oldest, oldest son, when he was Bo's age, he was 10 and he would, he would flinch. I would go, now you can't flinch. What are you afraid of? I'd be yelling and screaming. Um, and I told him, if you flinch again, I'll just throw the ball at you. So like, whatever you're afraid of, you'll get that. So if you're afraid of it hitting you, if you flinch again, I'm throwing the ball at you. I mean, that's, I mean, turn in your coaching card, you're out and probably your dad card while you're at it. Um, so, so yeah, fight that urge of like, no, I'm going to make my kid tough. They'll figure it out. Love them through the process. The last thing you want them to do is look back on the time you spent with them in a negative way. So um, I actually got that feedback from Bill Hasselman. Um, Hass, who big league played in the big leagues, was the third base coach with the Angels as recently as last year, I think. His son went to UCLA, and that was his feedback: was like, "Hey, dude, your son's gonna go wherever you should go. Make sure he looks back on the time you spent with him with love and adoration, and not like, man, my dad sucks." You know what you just did is you related with the audience. I'm sure uh, a couple of the dads listening, they've done that, they've reacted like that, then felt shame and embarrassment afterwards. We got to come up with a relate with the audience salute and, and maybe it's just right here you know challenge you just <laughs> i actually relate to that just as a parent uh it has nothing to do with baseball or ground balls but i find myself especially with my son who's only four and a half but really like pushing having uh, i'm afraid that if he's not tough enough that this world is going to chew him up and spit him out and so really pushing that narrative uh, a little too hard sometimes. And so thank you for sharing that uh, in the baseball context. A good reminder that uh, it's going to be okay. we got to love him through as parents. Uh, Coach, ball game. I also wanted to uh, just hook in. I would prescribe for this dad and this player uh, a, a two-hour on-the-couch father-son uh, viewing of Rally Caps, the movie. I think that has a that storyline in there and it does a great job of covering some of the aspects of, of this, uh, uh, that the, the child and the dad might find relatable. Absolutely. Good call there. Uh, uh, yes, I'm in a movie called rally caps. I play myself pretty much, but the, this theme comes up big time. Uh, and I'm, I'm right there with you flick money, a uh, quick sidebar before our next question, uh, before we, we started recording, Flick asked, how's your mind? How's your heart? How you feeling, Coach Ballgame? I'm good. I'm okay. I felt a little tired, a little, little wore out. Uh, real life, I, I did a lot of work this morning, so it's just a bit drained. But you know what's helping? I'm, I'm feeling energy. Just conversating with two friends. So uh, if you're feeling drained out there, if you're feeling a little worn out, man, get with two buddies, Zoom them, FaceTime them, and just talk. I think it really does help a lot. It gives you that energy you need. So, um, again, why do we do this 99 times, 99 episodes? It's for our own brain. That and a power nap. Power nap helps too. And a bang biscuit. <laughs> well, 15 minute. I'm going to get on my dad recliner with right under the fan over here and just, uh, hey, boys, dude, hold my calls. I'll be out yeah. for 15. 
that that is how you bang a biscuit that right there you take a power nap um this one's uh, uh this one's from a coach who's who's just depleted of of tools uh the kids are not listening at practice and they cry after a loss uh because they don't listen during practice and they make mental mistakes any tips we try to incentivize with tops baseball cards um, but at what point do you introduce disciplinary action in sports? Um, I, uh, just reading this, uh, I, I appreciate your passion uh, and your, first of all, for volunteering your time to be out there with these kids. Add a boy to you, coach. Um, but I, I definitely uh, sense uh, in this question that that there's just some anger there with you. And and I've been there. Chopper just talked about it. We're, we've all been there where there's this, uh, they're just not, they're not uh, jumping on the program. They're, they're upset when they lose, but they're not willing to work hard during the practice and make the necessary steps uh, to get to that point. So uh, for this coach, that's just a little lost. Uh, Chopper um, your kids are making mental mistakes in the game. Uh, and then they get upset after they lose. Uh, but it, it's because of a lack of preparation. Where's that balance between empowering, encouraging, and then disciplinary? Yeah, I think you got to know your audience. So if it's a Little League team, a bunch of youngsters that are just out there to have fun, um, I, I, I sense from that question that the coach is kind of seeing his identity in the win or the loss. Um, and so – change change the definition of what a win is did your group have fun did they get uh, baby steps towards being maybe more uh fundamentally sound or have a higher baseball iq um, celebrate it when they do something right in game um, quietly talk to them when it doesn't quite go their way and you can just remind them like hey tell you what next practice we're going to do a drill on that don't you worry about that we're gonna we're gonna get after that and just really try to promote a different definition for winning. Uh, and if it's, it sounds like that was a, that was a, that's a little league team. Um, so yeah. Yeah. So understand what little league's for, man. I mean, there's a pledge, right. And the pledge doesn't say a whole lot about discipline. I think it talks about having fun and being a good, good human. So um, that's the win in little league. If you want to do something different, um, come do the, uh, the coach ball game playbook. And we can talk a little bit about uh, club baseball. Um, and that's, that's kind of what it sounds like he's trying to coach to, but it's the wrong audience. So uh, when the kids are crying, throw candy at them and, uh, and get them to the pizza parlor as quick as you can and get their mind off of it. They'll forget real quick. There you go. Now flick money. Let's say uh, this is a, uh, an elite 12, 13, 14 year old team. Uh, and they're doing the same thing They they think they can just go through the motions and practice. Uh, and then they're very upset and they cry when they lose the game. What, where do you go there? Yeah, uh, middle schoolers, this is a kind of a constant battle, right? Because they, they want adult level uh, results for for having put in the work, but they themselves don't understand how to put in the work. A lot of times at practice, they want to make their friends laugh and have a great time. So uh, this is a challenge. Uh, what I uh, I agree with you, Coach. What I hear from this coach is some frustration, maybe, maybe even a little resentment at not being listened to, uh, feeling like he's not heard. and uh, what I would say, Coach, is uh, is you have to be find your inner calm, like your inner zen. You you have to expect that this is exactly how 12, 13, 14 year old boys are going to act. You can have high expectations. You can have standards. You can have you know like I don't. For me, discipline is like uh, if a kid's child's not listening, I often would do like five push-ups. You know. Give us all five push-ups if you want to, you know, if you want to chat while we're having a meeting because you're taking all of our time. So this is a reminder that it's our time and we're here to get better. So it's not like a, an anger thing. I'm not assigning them to them and screaming at them. It's just like these are our standards. You're going to do push-ups. You're going to do crunches. You might do a, you might hit a sprint to the center field fence and back every once in a while. Um, but it's a reminder. I, I communicate it in love. I get it. I was 13 once. This is a reminder. We'll all cheer for you. We'll make a tunnel. When you run back from the fence, we'll make a tunnel and we'll high five you. And then we're going to get back into this drill and have a great uh, and have a great experience and learn. So I do think there's a, a, a way to build a container to keep the fun, 
keep it engaging. What I'm hearing though, is that kids may not be that engaged in some of the stuff you're doing at practice. Um, and so uh, if you haven't checked out Coach Ballgame's playbook, uh, how to engage kids, how to set up a practice, how what the timing should be, um, how you capture their attention, uh, if you haven't done that yet, I highly recommend that because I think you'll, there's a lot of tools that can help with the engagement piece. Basically, the answer is uh, do the playbook and then listen to the other 98 episodes of this podcast. And then <laughs> your life is going to be just fine. I will add this. I think your next practice deserves a two-hour conversation where you guys sit. Maybe you bring some burgers, maybe some uh, some snacks. And uh, it seems like some trust can be built uh, in this group where you're going to go, you know what, reset. I, I want to get to know you boys a little bit more. Uh, I want to hear your story. I want to hear why you get upset after the game. I want to hear from you kids what's going to make this season better. What's going to help us win? And I think just you by asking questions, and getting to know each kid, um, that that's going to that's going to be great. That's going to be. A, I think that's a great way to 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 spend a practice for anybody. But open up the conversation a little bit. Get some trust. Maybe they'll come up with some ideas. You know what? I feel like I'd want to work on ground balls more if we did this, if we made it a little more fun. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think we're all on the same page here. And, and Coach, once again, thank you for, uh, for volunteering your time. Find your inner zen. Uh, have a, have a two-hour conversation with your team uh, where, where you are coming from a place of joy and unconditional love. And, and just listen to them for a little bit. That's not weakness. Um, uh, I think the, the military stance of they're not doing it the way it should be done. So I'm going to run them and push ups and just have this angry tone, all that it's not working, not working. So, um, listen, listen to them. Uh, th this particular dad is, uh, got a seven-year-old who's crazy about baseball, loves watching baseball movies. Hope you've seen rally caps then. Um, and is a is a big fan of of playing baseball as well. Uh, but this dad, not a lot of field space, not a lot of sand lots in this town. Uh, the population is low uh, compared to other cities. What should I do, or how do I go about the lack of baseball fields in my town? Well, if you've ever seen one of my sand lots, we've done them on basketball courts. We've done them. Uh, on parking lots, and those are really fun. We've done them on blacktops. Uh, any open uh, field, any any open grass area behind churches or schools are perfect. Um, a, a lot of a lot of folks think you got to have that dugout, you got to have that dirt, you got to have that foul line, you got to have the best equipment. Well, that's nonsense. Um, if you go down to the Dominican Republic, you'll see there are potholes and bare feet and sticks and bottle caps, and, and they are loving the game. So uh, if you can find an open area, you might have a more, you might have a smaller area to work with, which means, okay, we, we got to go tennis balls here, uh, or we, we've got to go wiffle balls uh, in this particular area. They're still going to have some fun with that. I promise you all of my sand lots for the most part, are tennis balls. So we don't have to use a huge space. We can actually have three sandlot games going at one time on a 200-foot field. So um, I, I hear you. I understand you. And what I've noticed is as I go around the country and I run my sandlots, people are like, so this thing does exist. We can play a game on a blacktop or in a gym. Uh, you can really play anywhere. Drop some bases down. I use cones as the dugout, uh, and that really helps a lot, too, to keep things organized and keep kids away from the, the batter. Um, but, yeah, I think you can find that open patch. The reason I started my sandlots is because I noticed all of these little parks with backstops that were very small, uh, and they were they were conjoined with uh, with a with a playground but they they were never being used so that's where i started doing my sandlot so uh i think uh i think you got something there boys you got anything else for for our man a wall uh, a brick wall and a tennis ball you can play a whole game like that if he loves baseball you throw it a little bit higher on the wall that'll generate the ground ball 
and then he short hopped the wall. That'll turn him into the first baseman, and he can play nine innings like that. Um, yeah, tennis ball on a wall is a great way to go. There's low flight wiffle balls if you're low on space. Uh, the little miniature golf wiffle balls are awesome. Uh, traveled with those in high school anytime I went on a trip. Those were great. Uh, but yeah, just anywhere where he can catch the ball and throw the ball. And obviously bow nets we all know about is a good thing. Uh, key work is awesome. Um, you don't need a big space. We, we, we ran a high school program yesterday because they're overseeding the field behind the field on a patch of grass. And we got a ton of quality work done. Yeah. Like money. Well, yeah, I'm, I grew up uh, in far, the far North a little place called Eastern Washington. So we were on, we were on the, our, the blacktop where driver's ed practice driving um, to uh, when the snow was on our field uh, in March and April. Um, and then we did a lot of gymnasium baseball. Um, and, you know, you can, I love the idea of working with different kinds of balls for different goals. You know, tennis balls are great. They're fun for the hitters because they fly, they fly so fast. So in small spaces, you may need to dial it down, tape up a wiffle ball, or you get the low flight balls. Uh, you got some different options there, but, uh, yeah, it's amazing. The best players in the world uh, do not have little league fields. Uh, yeah. So it goes to show you. There you go. Uh, the DR uh, uh, for sure. I'll finish with this, man. The the kids seem to love this game called volleyball baseball that we've created where we get a volleyball or a kickball and we have one bat and uh, the batter hits the ball and then the fielders can play kickball from there. They can peg the runner. They can tag them. Uh, but if you've got a confined area, those things don't go too far. Uh, that that makes for a really fun scrimmage game. So where there's a will, there's a way. I did a post recently about anxiety and why do you get anxious as parents when you're watching your kids play? I uh, challenge you to go look at that post a few weeks ago and and look at the comments. There's thousands of them on Instagram and Facebook, and it was a it, it was a curriculum for me on on why we, we talk about don't don't get anxious because the kids don't perform well. But I think the real root is why? why? Why do we get anxious? And this came from a parent. Uh, it's not really a question, but it's a, a reason why they get anxious. Not putting it. Uh, 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 br brought it into my DMs. My son's a catcher and and I get anxiety because that's a high pressure position that doesn't always get the accolades it deserves. Every single pitch is on his shoulders. Everything goes well and we're fine. But if a pitcher is a little wild, the coach would blame the catcher and console or calm the pitcher. Um, well, there's red flags there, uh, right out of the gates. It would give me such anxiety. During playoffs, made it to the States, I would literally shake with anxiety. Um, so it seems like this particular anxiety is stemming from uh, the way the coach is approaching it. So I think that this can be two pronged right here, but um, I, I would say 50% of the reason sport youth sports has gotten toxic is because it's win at all cost. The other 50 is because of the anxiety coming from parents and coaches. Um, that's my opinion. But on this topic of anxiety, um, I, I'll just speak sp specifically to this mom. Um, have, have a calm chat with the coach because it seems like the coach is picking out this catcher. And for some reason, I'm thinking maybe that coach used to be a catcher and is living vicariously through your son. Uh, maybe this coach is upset with the way their playing career ended and is is kind of projecting uh, that that's one reason why a grown person would demean a catcher uh, and then uh, be, be consoling or calming everybody else um, uh, picking favorites and not having favorites that's there's there's a that's stemming from something traumatic um, so having a conversation uh, where the coach uh, here's your side of things and just just be plain and honest and always start the conversation with thank you for volunteering to coach my son. Uh, uh, there's thank you for your time. 
here's what I'm noticing. My kid doesn't love baseball anymore because of the way you're picking on him or, or picking him out of the crowd and uh, demeaning him in the middle of the games. He's trying his hardest. Can I just have a reason why there? I think, I think laying it out like that, where there's no anger, where you're not shutting him off immediately with a um, screw you. No, it's coming from a place of empathy. And then I think if you, as the the parent here, if you can talk from a place of empathy where, okay, I understand why this coach is doing this. It's because maybe something didn't go right in their life. Maybe that's how they were coached. Um, I think that's a great start. Uh, I don't know where you guys want to go with this. I don't know if you want to talk to this mom, you want to talk to all coaches out there, um, fire away. I'm going to bring up a, a new concept in this conversation. It's called emotional leadership. Uh, this mom is, if it's a mom, in fact, that did, I'm, that did write this, whether it's a mom or a dad, whoever the parent is, uh, my, uh, request for you, for yourself, for your child and for the coach is to show some emotional leadership here. So emotional leadership is going to look like you gaining control of your anxiety to have the conversation. There's some tremendous breathing techniques that help, uh, but a, a good little shorthand version is uh, smell the pizza for four, blow out the birthday candles for six, and uh, and it'll open your blood vessels. That'll slow your heart rate down, and that's going to help. You need to. We need to model the emotional control that we want children to be learning, and that we want uh, a high intensity, you know, maybe high. Um, Yell, kind of a yeller, screamer type coach. We need to model for them what it looks like to have that conversation. Um, so emotional leadership. And uh, I would also approach with curiosity. You know, hey, I notice you you talk to him this way in the games or when this is happening with a pitcher, it seems like you engage with the catcher in a certain way. What, um, I would love to learn more about it. What's, where does that come from? You know, from what I'm looking from where we're, I'm sitting as a parent, I'm seeing p- pitchers all over the place. And uh, and I and then I'm just definitely noticing the impact on my child. So I'm I'm interested to learn from you. Can we learn from each other and uh, see if there's a way to move forward? Um, but I would plan for defensiveness because the, these the coaches who coach like this, including myself, when I've been approached at times, we get defensive. Uh, the male a- anxiety reaction often looks like anger or defensiveness. So um, just plan for that. I'm with you there. Absolutely. Flick money, uh, beautifully uh, put. I will add this. Chad Chopper uh, uh, has a little video that I dropped on my social media uh, uh, today where he talks about detaching your joy from the result. So I think that's a great place in the game for you to start. If you detach your joy from the result, from from the outcome of, of your child, and maybe that's... Uh, Maybe that's going 0 for 4. Uh, Maybe that's getting yelled at by the coach. But if you can detach your joy from all those outcomes, that's step one. And then step two is actually confronting with curiosity this coach um, and expecting uh, a defensive response. Chopper, anything to add there? Uh, Just coaching the coach, uh, we've got to be a little bit better. Uh, Got to be a little bit better than that. Uh, encourage the coach to be a comforter in chief. Um, I'm sure the coach isn't listening, but any coach out there that yells and screams at their kids, they are well aware the ball got past them. They're well aware that their job is to catch the ball. Catch is the root word of catcher. They're they're not shocked by the fact that they're not doing their job. They would really appreciate a pat on the back or a, hey, I believe in you. Let's get this next moment. You can do it. I'm proud of you. I love you. Like that might help. The yelling and screaming will not help and we got to stop. That's why we have a podcast about it. Bang. Have either have either of you watched yet the Trey Turner documentary on Netflix called Not The yet, Turnaround? But I'm going to. I can't wait. It's 25 minutes. It is unbelievable. But the long and short of it is Trey Turner inked a $300 million contract to go play in Philadelphia. Okay. He's a professional athlete. He's a uh, five tool, unbelievable baseball player. Gets to Philly, starts pressing a little too hard. Makes a few makes a few errors early in the season, uh, punches out, strikes out a few times, starts squeezing it too tight, and then the harder he tried to get out of it, the worse it got. This is a professional baseball player. 
the best, arguably the best shortstop in in the National League, maybe in baseball. I mean, it's, and so the, and the Philly fans got louder and louder, yelled at him. This is a this is a metaphor for what we do to children. The Philly fans are screaming at him, and it's getting worse and worse and worse. By August, he's hitting like 110, 117. He's 0 for his last 17. And the crux of the documentary is that this one Philly sports fan, who himself was a screamer and yeller and had partaken in all of the hazing and screaming and venting at athletes in Philly, he just had an aha moment, and he made a little video, and he said, what if we just give Trey Turner a standing ovation tomorrow? For no reason, and it goes. It went away. Caught fire. Catch catches fire in Philly. The radio stations pick it up. It goes viral. And um, what happens when we choose to use our energy as a comforter in chief, as an elevator of energy, as a lifter, as a supporter? When we focus our chi in that way, our, our life force in that way, it's very powerful. What can happen? And um, I won't spoiler. I won't spoil the whole thing. But um, yeah, this this is a, a great metaphor for that. Um, the, the next question is basically the same thing. My son has recently moved to a new league. Uh, I was, uh, on the last coaching staff. I'm on this new coaching staff as well as an assistant coach. One coach on my son's nine ten U uh, team is all old school going all Bobby Valentine on these boys in their first practice. Some of them are first time players. How would you deal with this type of coach? Uh, me being the new coach on the staff. When it seems like this coach of 20 years, according to him, is set in his ways, uh, how do I go about it? Um, it's very similar uh, to the last question where it's got to start with trust, which stinks for you, but you got to build trust with Bobby Valentine first, uh, whether that's a beer or a coffee. Then you got to confront with curiosity, uh, as Flick Money just, just stated. And then you can state you're, you can you can you can tell them the honest truth, but you're doing it from a place of empathy, which again stinks. But it's the only way this guy's going to hear it. He's been doing it for 20 years. Um, do you guys have anything to add uh, from what we already talked about here with with this assistant coach um, going up against uh, Mr. Blowhard? Coach, I echo everything you said. The building of trust. Thanking him. Thanks for being a head coach. Thanks for doing this for 20 years. Um, I'm curious as to your style. And the reason I'm curious is because I'm watching how uh, not only I'm noticing my own reactions, but I'm watching how my child's reacting. And um, there's all kinds of research, you know, the old school Bobby Knight where, where fear is the motivator. If you're afraid of getting yelled at, if you're afraid of being yanked out of a game, if you're afraid of being, you know, embarrassed or shamed then that you're going to play better. Um, uh, it turns out <laughs> that uh, science, uh, that that's not true. That's not the best motivator. It is a motivator. It can be a motivator, um, but it's certainly not the most effective one for developing a young ball player. And so, uh, yeah, but that conversation has to happen very uh, uh, with a lot of uh, compassion, a lot of appreciation, and slowly over time. It's not You're not going to rebuild, uh, rebuild his whole worldview in a day. I uh and and somehow start shoving them this podcast, start sending it my way. Uh, uh it, you know, if if nothing else works, I would love to chat with these kinds of coaches and and just uh, uh, be the bad guy in the situation. Um, I'm I'm good with that. I know Chopper and Flicky, they've said the same thing as well. So we're here to support and we're here to um squash this toxicity. Uh, but you have to do it, uh, it, it, you have to do it in a way of curiosity and, uh, and patience and empathy, a hundred percent. Uh, and, and I think something else that works is, uh, self-deprecation, you know, but uh, uh, if you can, if you can say, you know what, I've reacted this way in certain places in my life and, and I, I understand, I get it. Um, that might, that maybe that opens up the ears of Bobby Valentine, you know, uh, Chaparuski, he just talked about it. It, it. He talked about how he failed. Uh, I've talked about my failures. So is Flicky. And, um, it's, it's a great way to open up some ears, especially male ears. I, I don't like being told I'm bad or I'm doing it wrong. 
especially when it's become routine. So um, these questions are awesome and lit and I'm putting a, putting a marker on it because there's, there's many more that, that will hit in the coming weeks. But before we close up shop today, um, it's World Series. It, it's World Series time. And for the first time since 1981, which was the year before I was born, the Yankees are playing the Dodgers in the World Series, the two biggest cities, the two biggest payrolls, the two biggest franchises. Golly, who's going to win and why? We'll start with you, Sean Flicky. Coach, um, I've got the Dodgers in seven, and here's why. I think uh, I like their pitching better. Pitching and defense, when you get when all the off great offensive players kind of cancel each other out, pitching and defense uh, is what it usually generally comes down to in big spots. Uh, I love I love the Dodgers uh, defensively, and um, the other thing I will say is. Uh, vibes i played against aaron boone in college he was a sc guy when i was at stanford i like the guy uh, i respect him as a both as a player and a, as a baseball guy his dad bob boone played at stanford uh was a fantastic 20-year big leaguer and um i got to spend some time at the boone household i have deep respect for that family and we played but we both played against dave roberts at ucla doc roberts is an incredible leader I, I think of another magnitude and uh, i'm given the vibes edge i think booney's playing for his job uh, a little bit and i think that's a little bit of a tense uh, that's a fear-based mechanism and i think doc roberts is uh doc roberts is in the fully in the vibes uh monitor role of being able to just elevate and watch enjoy uh someone something magnificent happening that's greater than the sum of the parts and so i'm giving vibes to the dodgers too a lot of interesting uh, rivalries here. Of course, you got uh, the two biggest franchises, Yankees, Dodgers. You've got that Red Sox Yankees thing with uh, Boone versus Doc Roberts. Also, the USC UCLA rivalry between them as well. Interesting going Dodgers in seven. Chad Chop, you lived in that clubhouse, you've mentored many of the guys in that lineup for the LA Dodgers. I'm guessing you're going Yankees in four. Yeah, Yankees uh, to lose to the Dodgers in six is uh, <laughs> is kind of what I think. I think the one X factor is what the Guardians found out the hard way is that they we just got to keep the baseball in the yard. Um, if the Yankees start being the Bronx Bombers, um, that could change the narrative really quickly. So um, highly recommend throwing some chase breaking balls. Uh, don't be afraid to walk a guy or two, especially – if their last name is Stanton judge or Soto um, Soto won't chase, but Stanton, you can get him to chase judge is shown shown uh, that propensity to chase a little bit in the postseason more than he's has in the season. So I would highly recommend a fastball up and in that looks like it might be that slider um, might get a pop up there, just get them off their game a little bit. And then every other slider needs to start as a strike and end up as a ball. Um, and I think if you can take advantage of that, uh, the Dodgers will handle them, but if they make some mistakes or they go for Lando sliders and curveballs, um, those Yankees are going to be sitting and laying in wait. Also, if Juan Soto is nodding his head like a psycho after every pitch, put the man Walk on him. Walk put him. Put the man on. <laughs> put the man on, because he's he knows something that you don't. Um, would uh, it, there would you have walked Juan Soto after he spoiled the nastiest changeup I've seen? Would you have walked him to get to Aaron Judge in that moment? Yeah, Aaron Judge. I wouldn't have walked him to get to Stanton, but I'd have walked him to get to Judge for now. It, and that's the heartbeat of the game, right? The heartbeat of the game is Judge isn't the judge of the regular season right now. Now every swing could change that, and he did it a time or two against the Guardians, but like. I don't know what his average is, but it's low. Um, and and sometimes it's better to go with what you don't know versus what you do know. And I think we could all feel in that at bat. I was watching that at bat from my office right here. And I was like, every pitch, I was like, oh my gosh, he is spoiling everything. If this dude throws a fastball, it's a homer. 
and he threw the fastball and it's like it was slow motion i was coming in and it wasn't high enough and it was oh my gosh he hit it high enough and far enough um but no i would have definitely put him on to get to judge and in hindsight's 2020 i loved what steven vote said learn the lesson leave the event you want to yeah. talk about mental toughness um steven vote and he's an absolute savage he was in that giants clubhouse after i got there and crawl and all these guys talk about just how much of an incredible human he is and teammate and man. So um, he's going to learn from this. He's going to be better for it. An incredible leader, leader in Steven Boat. Uh, but yeah, I'm going Dodgers in six if they can keep the ball in the yard. Uh, you're touching on something, Chopper, and this is an intangible coach and coach ball game. You've been talking about the randomness of baseball. Especially in the high leverage playoff moments. High leverage playoffs. Inevitable. It's coming down. It's going to happen game six or seven, uh, probably at Dodger Stadium, where there's going to be a random thing happen, and that's that's it. I just read a study, Coach. Uh, uh, They did a study, an extended study of 160 Olympic athletes, the highest performing athletes in every event in, in the world. What separates people who have dedicated their entire life to training for one event, one moment, who performs better and who does not perform as well, even if their PRs had been good enough to to medal coming in? What separates them is uh, there's usually about four or five practices, mental training practices that the highest performing athletes engage in, some form of visualization, seeing themselves do it before it ever happens practice like that's a part of their routine is some kind of visualization positive self-talk you remember what kurt gibson told us when we were in detroit what did he say when he was going up there to face eckersley what did he tell himself yeah i'm 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 a savage in the box i can do this yeah i can do this he said i could do this and then he said emergency when he got to two strikes and that's why he kept fouling the ball off emergency stance yeah, he had his emergency stance, but he said, my parents had raised me. I believed in myself. And so I would tell myself, I've done this before. I can do this. And I've done this before. So some kind of positive self-talk, some kind of relaxation, meditation, breathing, controlling the heart rate, right? Um, uh, there are people who are just blessed. Manny Ramirez never had to do any of this stuff because he was just blessed with the kind of mind that was perfectly attuned to be absolutely chill when everything else got high leverage and intense. But for a lot of us, we have to work at it. These tools are, the the good news is they're trainable. They're learnable. There's a few more things actually. But um, so the the reason I'm bringing this up is because what Chopper just touched on was Aaron Judge. He's pressing just a little bit. He's still a world, he's still unbelievable. He's still going to probably hit, he'll hit balls out of the yard in the World Series. But you can see it that he's just a little a little more prone to the chase, a little more, a little tighter on the handle, a little more butt poke out and chase that slider. And so um, that's the intangible. Who who uh, reacts better or whose training comes out and they're able to be totally dialed in in those big moments. And that's why I think, yes, it's random from one perspective, but it's also not random from another perspective. Some people are very good at this uh, collective skill set. I look at this quote, boys, uh, from our practice plan. I'll read it to you. This is for tomorrow's practice plan. I'll read it. Uh, Your first thought may be negative. That's okay. It's natural to have negative thoughts, but you don't have to listen to or act on them. Own your second thought. Choose good. Believe the best. The more you do it, the better you get at it. Make your mindset your advantage. And that's from Kevin DeShazo. Uh, But it's exactly what you just touched on, Flick Money, and that's what's going to the high school boys tomorrow. Um, the more you practice it, the better you get in these big moments who can keep the moment, just what it is. It's still baseball. He still has to throw the ball. I still have to see it hit the bat. Um, and so if they can do that and it's our job as coaches to teach our kids, this at a young age, positive self-talk, like you just said, I took notes while you were talking, flick money visualization. I remember being on deck, seeing myself hit home run, home run, and then hitting a ball 500 feet. And I saw myself do it before it happened. I vividly remember that. In college, I was taking hydroxy cut and I said, if I, I'm either going to die of a heart attack right now, because my heartbeat was, was going about 300 beats per minute. I'm either going to die of a heart attack or hit a home run. And I chose to see the homer and not the heart attack. So if you have a choice mentally, choose the homer. Oh, bang biscuit. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I love this. I I'm going Dodgers in seven. And here's why, because the team that hits the most foul balls in the series is going to win. 
the team that can spoil the most amazing pitches, specifically from the bullpen, I think is going to win. And I think the Dodgers bullpen has the most swing and miss. Uh, the, the, I think Blake Trinan versus Luke Weaver uh, is going to be a, a beautiful matchup. And if Luke wins that matchup, then maybe we go Yankees in seven. But I, I just got faith in friend of the pod Trinan. He's going to – the sweepers just swing and miss. It's too, there's too many swings and misses. So I I'll be interested to count the foul balls in the series because uh, the, these bullpens are a bit tired and they're going to be really tired by, uh, by game six or seven. So uh, I'm going Dodgers in seven because it's trying and over Weaver uh, by a scope. Yeah. Trying and tr- trying and sweeper moves 21 inches right to left with, uh, with some vertical break and, uh, and his changeup uh, has at times will move 21 inches left to right. It's cr- and it's at, like halfway to home plate. They're in the balls in the exact same spot. It's absolutely bananas what he's able to do with the baseball. It's it's crazy. I got to, I I totally am with you on that, coach. Yeah, yeah. Uh, chopper X factor that uh, I just thought of. Josh Bard, the bullpen coach for the Dodgers, was the bench coach for Aaron Boone with the Yankees. So there could be some some knowledge that he has on what the Yankees hunt and kind of just their process. So that could be an X factor too, that I just thought of uh, Bardo's a savage and, uh, and he knows how the Yankees operate and how they look to gain a competitive advantage and what they look to hunt. So there may be that little cat and mouse game there too. Um, just with that familiarity with how the Yankees go about it. Ladies and gentlemen, sit back and just enjoy this world series. Uh, who knows if we have another one like this, um it's the biggest stars in the game uh going head to head and let's call it two of the best managers uh in the game going head to head as well and uh, let's see who wins that chess match uh i i got my money on trying and because he's his uh heartbeat is just made for this moment right here uh i'd love to see uh young mr weaver have the same heart rate he's got to prove that but um that I think both teams are going to hang a lot on those two dudes uh, at the end of game. So um, also excited to see uh, the, uh, the outliers. And and before we close up shop, I want to hear your, your surprise. Who's the guy who, what's the thing that, that could shift this series on its ear. It's weird for me to say, I'm going to say Tommy Edmond. He's the uh, MVP of the LCS, but uh, to to go in there and the Dodgers clubhouse, uh, you know, uh, ribbing him with a, oh, there's our cleanup batter coming in. Uh, and he did the job, man. He really did. Uh, Stanford boy. So I, I think if if Edmund can uh, uh, can just pick up Freeman slack, you know, who knows how healthy he's going to be, then, man, this might be a short series. But you guys got an outlier, a surprise? I'll go Teoscar. I think Teoscar Hernandez had some success against the Yankees earlier in the year. Um, hit a big home run, a grand slam, I think. Um, so I'll go with Teo. He's a, he's got some swing and miss, but he can also change the game with one swing. So I like Teo um, for the Yankees. I mean, I don't know if Rizzo's healthy. He could do something. Not for, Don't forget about Rizzo. Um, but I think it's going to come down to uh, if Judge can be a little bit more judgy. And, um, and so I think that's a big part of it. Yeah, I'd say also Torres, you know, it that that lineup is long if Torres is hot. Um, because then it's just bang, 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 bang. Flick money. I won't know on the intangible. I want to see I want to see body, I want to see body language, I want to see energy in the shoulders, I want to see how the faces are being held in the high, and then we're gonna find out who's I'll I'll have a better indicator who who's gonna emerge as the uh, potential um, wreck at Ralph uh, if, for their respective team, just based on how they're responding to, to the, to the, to the big stage, the biggest stage there is. Hey, change my answer ball game. Hey, how about this? Uh, I'll go with Hernandez. Then I get two players. I get Teo and friend of the pod Kike. You can't lose when you've already won. Bang. I'm going Hernandez. 
<laughs> boys i love it i love it i love it i'll see you on the playbook monday morning uh, all of our listeners uh, uh i hope you're you're going to be there if not spread the word to your friends uh the next episode we drop will be one hundy uh so that that that's going to be an absolute party boys i love you uh and i'm energized by you um uh, enjoy the this weekend of world series games enjoy your families um, salute leadership, salute, Bang. rake. <laughs>